part two so that you can learn everything else about land use and sustainability practices. There are a bunch of rules and unfortunately loopholes in how to manage a region of land based on how it's classified. Look at this list. If you have a job in protecting a rangeland, how do you think your priorities differ from that of a National Park Service ranger? Well, they're very different. So we're gonna take a closer look at that. Okay, now we know the basics of how public land is classified and the relationship between public land use and management. Let us look at issues in management. First, rangelands. What does BLM mean next to rangelands? That's right, Bureau of Land Management. And it is the federal agency responsible for managing rangelands. They manage grazing on public lands and rangelands are um, permit based. So if you are grazing a herd of cattle, you're paying for each cow. Rangelands are very susceptible to fires and overuse. Grazing pros, well, the land is too dry for crops, so why not move our cattle to the rangelands so cattle eat grass. Grazing animals is more environmentally friendly than putting them in feedlots or CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations. The cons of rangelands, they can pollute streams and surface waters. They can denude a region of vegetation, exposing it to wind erosion. And the soil gets too dry and too hard to allow water to infiltrate. BLM managers don't agree that it's bad though. So the Taylor Grazing Act of 1934 halted overgrazing, 1936-ish. It converted federal rangelands from a commons area into the permit-based grazing system we have today. This limits the number of animals that graze, but the permits are really cheap, overgrazing still happens, and the federal government is actually spending more time and money managing the land than they are in making it permit fees based. If you don't pay much for the front permit, then you can just have thousands and thousands of cows on the land. The Bureau of Land Management does not work with scientists and it does not prioritize for preservation. They manage grazing permits. Now, just like rangelands, the federal government spends more money managing forests than it gets in royalties. The United States Forest Service Agency's mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. Sounds all about like sustainability. This is a picture of sustainable logger. This approach has a goal of maintaining plants and animals and the entire ecosystem. Although using horses reduces soil compaction and environmental impacts, economically, this is not going to make you a millionaire. And back to the first picture of sustainable logging, this is what a forest looks like that has been sustainably harvested, not clear cut and not selectively cut. Beautiful, right? This picture was done in, or with the sustainable logging happened in Oregon. 30% of timber for worldwide use is harvested in the United States. This means we create an impact on forest ecosystems. This includes old growth forests too. An old growth forest is one like what Julia Butterfly Hill was trying to protect. Old growths host very specialized niches. Remember that? For very specialized species. They are 22% of the world's forests, although the number, unfortunately, is declining regularly. So, like I said, 30% of the world timber is produced in the United States and some in Canada. The United States Forest Service is always on a mission to produce more timber. So when they log deforest, then they reforest. So they replace these you know, mature old growth forest systems with what we call tree plantations. And here's a picture of one to the right. This is actually not in the United States. This is a picture of a rubber tree plantation in, in Thailand. So a tree plantation is a single, single type of tree that grows very, very quickly, matures very, very quickly and it, it's ecologically diverse forests will never develop because it's only one type of tree. 
The United States Forest Service manages how we harvest and use trees on public land. So we have two pictures or sets of pictures to the right here. Set A is all about clear cutting and set B is all about selective cutting. So clear cutting, we cut almost all the trees in an area. It's the easiest and most economical form of logging or deforestation. It's best for regrowth of fast growing trees because of all the sun exposure. We cut everything down, then sun is hitting everything. Thing. And it's only worth it if all the trees that are cut actually are worth some value. Clear cutting on slopes, however, increases wind and water erosion, which causes the loss of soil and nutrients. It also adds silt and sediments to downstream, which harms aquatic populations. It allows for more sleds, mudslides. It increases sunlight in rivers because the trees are not providing any shade. This is all bad, bad, bad. It causes habitat alteration and destruction and forest fragmentation, and these effects lead to decreased biodiversity and lower aesthetic value for the forest. Then we have selective cutting, which is shown in pictures top and bottom for B. Selective cutting removes single trees or just a couple of trees spattered throughout the forest. It creates an opening for reseeding, produces optimum growth for um, different types of trees that need different types of shade, so they have different shade tolerance. There, there is less of an extensive environmental impact when we do selective cutting than clear cutting, but the negatives are it's still logging. We're still fragmenting and messing with the habitat. Um, we still have to build roads in order to get the equipment for logging, so we're fragmenting that way. And we're still going to affect species diversity by doing that. We, we impact the habitat, we impact the species. It's still gonna compact soil because of all the machinery. And by compacting soil, we're leading to nutrient loss and reductions in water infiltration. And remember, this lack of infiltration means groundwater doesn't recharge. So water goes right downstream into a river, a lake, or ocean instead. So you need to know all these pros and cons. Okay, here I've shown you two of the methods and added another one on how we can harvest trees depending on what our needs are and how much money we're gonna make. Notice the selective cutting on the very top picture, the clear cutting in the middle picture, and then we have something called strip cutting on the bottom picture. That wasn't in your book, but you can. it's pretty obvious what each one of those means. Um, portions of the forest are harvested instead of entire forest or going sporadically throughout. And you already should know the advantages and disadvantages of each. So I have four pictures here that I have borrowed from a different textbook. We have the selective cutting in picture A, which I've gone over now twice. So we still leave some older, more mature trees back, but we have to bring the equipment in to get everything. In picture B, top right corner, we have something called shelter wood cutting. This is where the younger, more um, younger trees get older. They produce seedlings, which then get to grow into more mature trees. And then we have C in the bottom left corner. This is seed tree cutting, where we leave a few of the important trees behind in order for them to still seed and provide shade doesn't say that part and then D again is clear cutting so forests provide natural capital for us they provide major ecological and major economic services these are things that are worth money so we're gonna look at this list and I want you to think while you're looking at the list which two ecological services do you think are the most important? So these are all ecological services that forests provide for us. I'm about to show you economic services. Do you think you can come up with two economic services that forests provide? Well, here's some. And which do you think is most important? So it's all about perspective. What you think is important might not be what I think is important, which brings us to the multi-use management. When we log our precious forests, we leave them alone 
and then eventually succession creates a second growth forest. Do you remember succession? We went over that like many, many, many chapters ago. So this is when new growth happens and we usually have our pioneer species. A specific species come first and then a new type of species comes second and third and it's all about shading and it's all about competition. So there is a natural type of succession that comes from different types of logging. So when we log, and we leave it alone, we're gonna get a type of secondary succession and second growth forest. Or we can replace everything that we cut down and we can put our own seeds in and that's where we get our tree plantation. Now tree plantations have a short rotation cycle of cutting and regrowth. And that short cycle is still maybe long in your lifetime because it's 25 to 30 years. So look to the left where the clear cutting has occurred and just kind of follow around. We've clear cut everything and then follow it down, okay, to where all the trees have been cut and then follow it over where you see that seedlings are now being planted and then they go in and they remove some things. The trees can grow more rapidly year round. The rotation cycle can be shorter. Old growth or secondary forests are clear cut and we provide land for growing mostly tree plantations. So as I explained before, natural capital is the capital that benefits what, what we get out of a forest. So when we say natural capital degradation, that's a result of deforestation. I wanna know how we are harming our natural capital. So what do you think would show up in our list here? So this is a list of harmful environmental effects of deforestation that can reduce biodiversity and the ecological services provided by forests. You need to know this stuff. And we've already talked about almost every one of them except for the, re uh, we talked about release of CO2 in the atmosphere, but we've talked about every one of these. Notice how we keep revisiting really important content and going a little deeper now. So I just had to show you this picture. Look really carefully. So this was once all like the left side of the picture. The right side of the forest was clear cut. And you can see all the roads they had to build in order to move the machinery to carry the logs to and from and to even cut the trees down. So they didn't get to the left side yet. This is what the environment looks like when we clear cut. I've already told you this. I'm curious if you've been paying attention and if you can process all of it. Clear cutting does have advantages, it has disadvantages. If it didn't have those advantages, we wouldn't do it anymore at all. So I want you to think about two things that you think might show up on the list for advantages and two things that you think might show up on the right. Did you come up with any of those for advantages? So you're gonna pause the video after I show this slide. Come up with two disadvantages of clear cutting. I'm sure you thought of one of these or two of these. You should pause this and you should review and study it. So sustainable forestry allows us to maintain our forests so we can use them for all the purposes, all the greater good, and they'll be here for generations to come. So solutions to sustainable forestry are on the table to the left. Some, and I want you to look at this table and pause the video. And I want you to think about maybe one or two that are most important to you. So by reading it, and figuring out which one or two are important to you, you're learning while you read. So we can use forests more sustainably bleh, if we really consider the ecological services provided by it. And if we harvest trees so that they can always be replenished and so that we can protect the old growth trees. Oh, but before I move on, I wanna tell you which ones are important to me. I definitely think recycling, it's so easy to do that recycling and buying recycled products should be a no-brainer. I definitely believe in buying sustainable wood. I would not be buying redwood and I would not be buying wood that is not sustainable wood or from an old growth forest. So buying bamboo is fine. Buying oak is actually fine. And landscaping my yard with a diversity of plants that are indigenous to or native to the area, 
actually really helps with the local forests. Okay, so did you know that we actually have more forest coverage than we did in 1920? Well, it's not as many old growth forests and it's not as many diverse forests because we've replaced the forests that we logged and cut down with tree plantations. But overall, we still have more forests than we did in the 20s. And since the 60s, we are getting more old growth and second growth forests clear cut because we want that wood and we want to develop, we want to develop, we want to develop. Okay, we've been hearing a lot about forest fires in the news, a lot about it. Fire is very important to nutrient cycling and regeneration. It is not very friendly to houses that people live in, but we're really looking at fires and the ecosystem. So they're helpful. They cycle the buildup of dead biomass and they liberate early successional species. We used to suppress fires before we recognized how much they helped the ecosystem. And now that we know better, we conduct something called prescribed burns. One of the reasons we do this is an important historical fire that occurred in Yellowstone in 1988. There was so much biomass built up by suppressing natural fires and just natural fires not happening there for a long time that there was a fire and it got out of control. And after the fires of Yellowstone burned one third of the national park take a look at the map to see how much of it was burned after that scientists were thrilled because they could see that there were new nutrients and the nutrients were making the habitat very very rich for early successional plant species and all those early successional species are the type that elk eat so then they started attracting a lot more elk at the park so we're just looking at this picture, and if you look to the right, that is a lot of dead biomass that looks incredibly flammable. So prescribed burns are literally very, very planned. You can see there are many, many park rangers, firemen, who knows what else, and they plan their area. The prescribed burn does not get planned in a day. It gets planned over weeks or maybe even months, and they find locations where there is so much built up dead, highly flammable, combustible biomass that they want to burn it before it catches on fire naturally and then spreads like crazy. And this is just one of hundreds of pictures you can find online for the prescribed burn technique. So let's recap. What are the types and effects of forest fires? Well, there could be types at different intensities and they can benefit or harm. So the effects are beneficial or they're harmful. So they can burn away flammable ground material that's good unless it's highly combustible material and it spreads like crazy. I mean, some of these fires move at like 50 miles per hour so fast you can't outrun them. They release a lot of valuable mineral, mineral nutrients and they provide openings or they provide a new home for early successional species. And those are like the, the plants that come first. So if we allow fires, because they're good, how do we make sure they don't cause damage to humans and human structures? We'll read the list. Control it. Have a good plan. So because of the controversy over fire management, like do we have all these prescribed burns or do we just let nature do its thing or do we actually suppress the fires? Congress met with a group of experts and decided to pass the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. And this was actually very recent in history. So this allows timber companies, the people that make money off cutting trees down, it allows them to cut medium and large trees from 71% of the national forests. So if they get to cut all those trees, the trade-off as part of this Restoration Act is that they have to take the smaller, more fire prone trees and they have to take any underbrush with them. So it's almost like they're working for the government and the trade-off is that they get to get all those big trees to make those big logs. But some forest scientists believe that this could actually create more fire problems. Now, in addition to rangelands and forests, we just spent a whole lot of time on forests. That's really important. But in addition to them and rangelands, we also have the national parks, 
which their job is to preserve the beautiful views and the beautiful landforms or unique landforms. We also have the National Wildlife Refuges, which are all about protecting wildlife. And we have the wilderness areas, which preserve a whole lot of land in order to keep the ecosystem intact. So if a builder, and this is happening constantly in our county, if a builder wants to build near a protected land, like a forest tract, for example, they're building next to a forest, they have to get a permit to do that. If it is a federally owned forest, they're going to have to follow the mandates under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. And this requires that an environmental assessment of the entire project is done before they get their permit. And that environmental assessment is supposed to be done by an expert, somebody that's been trained in looking for, are you going to impact the environment in some way from what you're doing? And then they get the environmental impact statement, which tells what the scope and purpose of the project is, whatever it may be. And then they have to come up with a mitigation plan, which is, okay, you are going to impact this stream. When you build here, you're gonna disrupt and dislodge the soil because of all the trees that you're cutting down. And by doing that, you're gonna to have to tell us what you're going to do to try to prevent it or to fix it after you're done developing. And that's the mitigation plan. And since many forests are now protected or protecting species, a lot of developers also have to put into their plans that they are going to make sure that they do not do anything to disrupt the habitat or the individual of any kind of endangered or protected species. And that's under the Endangered Species Act of 1973. And why do developers have to do that? Because we moved to the city like 100 years ago. We all just like, everybody just moved down there. So they went from rural, very rural areas and they all moved to the city, okay? This was like a century ago. And then the city people were like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm getting tired of living in the city. I'm gonna move outwards from the city a little. So I'm going to urbanize, I'm gonna go outside. So they moved to the suburbs. This was called urban sprawl, where people from the city started spreading out to more rural areas. And when they did that, there were no laws protecting the environment as they very rapidly developed. So this movement into suburbia is where people were moving around metro areas with a lower population density, which means you need a whole lot of roads to get a few people from point A to point B. And exurban is very similar to suburban, but they are not connected by buses. They aren't connected by highways. It's more like a whole lot of back roads and they don't have a very dense population. Urban sprawl is when urbanized areas spread into rural areas. So Bel Air and Aberdeen were rural, but urban Baltimore people spread out to these once the rural areas, um, they, like once they left Baltimore, and then they put up strip malls all over the place. You can see our strip malls and random unconnected buildings and schools all over the place. So if you look at this graph and you follow it from the left to the right, it highlights that shift. So all the way over on the left side in the 50s, it was, you know, most people were living in rural areas and there weren't many people living suburban. There were a lot of people living urban, but now we have most of our people living suburban and many, many less people living rural. And we're gonna talk about each one of these, but the four main concerns of urban sprawl are that we have more highways and more cars. And more cars, we need more highways. So it's a really ugly positive feedback loop. And people get more land for the same amount of money as they would in the city. So we're destroying more land because it doesn't cost as much to live in the suburbs. And then we have urban blight where the city revenue will shrink as people move to the suburbs because no one's paying taxes for living in the city and no one's buying anything in any of the stores in the city. That's urban blight. And then we'll go over in a minute with um, government policies that are concerns 
as a result of urban sprawl. So take a look at urban blight and what happens. You know, if we start with our neighborhoods declining, find that in the top left picture, neighborhoods decline. Then everybody moves to the suburbs because it's not safe to live there or they don't like being around all the pollution. Then nobody's paying taxes to the city budget and keep following it. And then services are cut so there's not as many buses or the buses don't run as often because there's not as many people that can pay for the buses. And then the businesses leave because they don't have as many customers. And then the neighborhood gets even worse because it's getting even poorer because there's no taxes. So even more people shift to the suburbs and even more tax revenue declines. This is a positive feedback loop. Don't be tricked and don't be fooled by that word positive. It's really a negative externality or a group of externalities. And then look at the next picture. So we have, um, as a result of living in the suburbs, we now have longer commutes. Do you see where that is? So now we've moved to the suburbs, our commutes are longer, therefore we use more gas, therefore we increase gas tax revenues, so we pay more taxes, therefore we need to build more highways, and we're gonna increase traffic congestion, which means that commutes are gonna be even longer, and we need even more gas, and we're gonna have to build more highways. So the more people move to the suburbs, the more we have those set of problems. So remember I talked about the federal um, the roads being built and the gasoline tax. So the Highway Trust Fund is a fund that collects taxes on your gasoline. You actually pay more for your gasoline tax than for other taxes in order to subsidize the construction and maintenance of roads and highways because we have to keep building highways because people keep getting cars and more people keep moving to the suburbs. And then there's zoning. So you need to understand what zoning means. And zoning is just uh, planners use zoning and they zone areas to create si um, quiet and safe communities. So we might say that downtown Bel Air, so many stores are zoned for commercial use. And when you get outside the, the heart of Bel Air, then there's only allowed to be 10, 10 stores or commercial properties used per square mile. That's what zoning is. Then we have multi-use zoning, and this will allow people to um, have retail or commercial use right in the middle of very dense residential areas. And that's like just, you know, people like families living there. So you can have a store right next to a house where people live. That's multi-use zoning. Also, there's subsidized mortgage, mortgages where we pay lower interest for people to purchase a home that would otherwise not be able to do so. So in areas where we want people to try and move now, we encourage subsidizing their mortgages. We actually help them pay for their house a little bit more than if you bought all this land and wasted land. So these are the government policies that go into effect to try and minimize our abuse and overuse of land for development. Now, I want you to think about smart growth. So a new suburban area might be uh, implementing more smart growth strategies as they develop, but an older area, which Harford County is actually a little older, might not have a lot of smart growth in it, so I want you to look at what these 10 smart growth strategies are, and you really need to understand them. So we've talked about different types of land use. So there's agricultural, and then there's educational, there's recreational, we have lots of land uses in Harford County. Um, creating a range of housing opportunities and choices, so people that can only live in an apartment, people that can be living in townhomes, people that want to have you know an acre or two of land are all they're able to all find that type of housing no matter where they look in a county. Creating walkable neighborhoods, so being able to walk everywhere safely. I don't know if we have that much of that in Hartford County. Encouraging, encouraging everybody in the community to be part of the development of Hartford County. I haven't met one person yet in Hartford County that actually goes to the county board meetings, which anyone in the public is allowed to, to talk about new building, new development, and new deforestation, and new highway construction, and new homes. Nobody goes to the meetings that I've ever met. Another smart growth strategy is taking advantage of smaller buildings, smaller, taller, more compact, less 
abuse of the land, leaving the grass there for water to infiltrate. Fostering distinctive and very nice looking communities um, to give a strong sense of place. Sense of place makes you feel good with where you live. Not like, I just got to go to my closet or I have to go to my mansion and just sleep there and I hate it. Preserving open space, preserving farmland, pre preserving the beauty that naturally was there in the past and protecting areas. Um, smart growth also has transit in mind with every place they develop. So buses will go anywhere they develop anything to take people around or trains or bike routes. So it's not all about cars. That's a smart growth strategy. Try and get people to stop driving cars and try to allow them to get around in smarter, more economically sensitive and pollution sensitive ways. Um, development is smart if they take old old buildings that aren't used anymore, knock them down and just fill right back up where the old building is rather than leave it vacant forever and just build up on the, on the grass in the forest that's right next to it. That's called infill. And number 10, urban growth boundaries. So making sure that when you develop, it's fair economically and environmentally, and it's not gonna cost a million dollars and think of the iPad equation. So these are really important strategies that Harford County is not real great at implementing. Some of it's because it's a little late, but there's also newer suburbs that have really done a great job implementing smart growth strategies. Okay, the module 30 answers were D, B, D, B, D. I'm sorry that this was just a whole lot of new information with not a lot of pictures and videos. I hope that you know a lot more and respect a lot more about development and land use and trying to preserve our land for sustainability for our future and for your children's and your grandchildren's future. This is Mrs. Gabriel signing off.